Welcome to Aorta Theater, I'm your host, Alexander Pinkle. Thank you for joining in, and I hope you enjoy a unique experience which combines the lore of old-time radio with the surreal macabre of everyday life. One cannot predict where the ebb and flow of Aorta will carry you. Tonight's episode takes a look at the old conundrum of how we appear to those around us, despite how we see ourselves. And while we all live and work with diverse relationships, from those we reel away from and loathe with a passion, to those whom we cherish and find ourselves gravitating toward, we all learn to cope and manage our emotions, striving toward happiness even in the most challenging situations. Tonight's episode, Clown Car, was written and produced for Aorta Theatre by M.D. Campbell. Aorta Theatre is a copyrighted program, all rights reserved. Reproduction or alteration is not permitted without express written consent. So please, sit back, get your pulse low, and enjoy a tale that will surely have you thinking about your own perception of yourself and those around you. Strangers, friends, and family, I humbly present to you Aorta Theater and Clown Car. You know, most people come here for the same reason. To escape reality for a little while. And who can blame them? Who doesn't love the circus? It's a classic throwback to a long time ago where simple, ordinary things become bigger than life. Colorful, hypnotic lights, the thick smell of fried dough and buttered popcorn, all wrapped in wild bells and carousel music, with barkers shouting from every booth, challenging you to test your skill, come win a prize, or to step inside and see the freaks of nature, all for the price of a small paper ticket. It's easy to get lost in the thrill of it all, to get caught up in the fanfare that is the circus. But there's one place to go and get away from the hypnotic lights and sounds to get your bearings and where time stops for a little while and the whole world becomes three rings of thrills and wonder. The Big Top. Handing off your ticket and stepping into the Big Top is like taking a trip inside a magic balloon, where decorated horses seem to prance on air and elephants perform incredible tricks while high above the world trapeze artists swirl through the air defying the laws of science in glorious glittery costumes. And once the ringmaster introduces the show... The outside world disappears with the roar of a lion, and you find yourself enclosed in a three-ring fantasy of fire and daredevils, performing feats of courage and daring while all eyes focus on wherever the spotlight leads them. Everybody is enamored by the big top. And between acts, when reality starts to seep back in, that's where I come in. My job is to redirect the crowd with chaos and laughter to create confusion so the other acts can shuffle off into the shadows and get ready for the next round. Even though the crowd undervalues my job, their eyes all fall on me when I come out of the darkness driving around in my little car, my little red clown car. For me, it's the most fulfilling moment in my life. To have that spotlight right on me as I drive around the second ring honking my horn and flashing my headlights. And even on the days when the crowd doesn't fill the seats, I still feel like I'm the most important person in the world. The crowd holding their breath until I step on the brake, put the car in park, and turn off the engine. Because that's when the whirling music disappears and the silent anticipation of the crowd is as loud as their heartbeats. For me, time stands still for that brief moment, and I am the star under the big top. But it only lasts for a moment, because sitting in my little red clown car with me, packed in like frozen pancakes, the others wait for the ringmaster's signal so they can burst out of the car and grab that sweet spotlight too. 
were all coiled like a colorful spring, waiting to pop out of a can of trick peanuts, just waiting for that perfect moment to surprise the crowd and leave an unforgettable impression they'll be smiling about for days, long after we've moved on to the next show in the next town. Still, none of us leaves the car, my exquisite little clown car, until Mr. George, the ringmaster, rings that musical little triangle that he keeps in his tuxedo pocket. That's our signal to go on. But between me turning off the engine of the car and Mr. George ringing that tiny triangle, time stops and it seems like an eternity. And let me tell you, it's no picnic being crammed in a tiny car with six other clowns, all wearing smelly, bulky costumes, wigs and hairspray, and more makeup than a mortician owns, and each of us with our twisted, eccentric ways of performing and our deep-rooted stage fright that brings up all kinds of doubt and fear. I tell you, it pushes us all right to the edge. And not for nothing, with all that fear and doubt, Performance anxiety creeps in, and we all go into a little frenzy sitting in that car. Now, the crowd can't see any of this because the windows of the car are tinted, so their anticipation of what we're going to do is like a water droplet just hanging above a dying flower in the middle of the desert. So, there we sit, inside my tiny, wonderful little clown car, just waiting and listening for that musical ring of Mr. George's signal to tell us it's time to come out and jump into that spotlight, that sweet, sweet spotlight. But it's the waiting and the listening that gets to us every single time. As I pulled up alongside the curb of the second ring, just past the orange marker where I'm supposed to stop, I turned off the engine and the motor choked and backfired. Now the crowd always thinks that's part of the act, but what it means to me is that I need to take the old girl into the garage to see the mechanic. Once again, you didn't pull up far enough, shouted Bitter in his typical blaming tone. Yes, we're all going to trip over that curb outside the ring, boss agreed calmly. Just try to be aware of that. Boss is always the calm one, except when she's not. She's been the lead clown of this troupe for over 20 years, and even though she's fair and accommodating, she can easily be swayed by the squeakiest wheel, which of course is always bitter. I thought I was supposed to go out first tonight, Coffee said as she coughed into her armpit, so why am I sitting in the back? Everyone groaned as Boss explained. You're thinking of today's show, you went first. This is tonight's show, and it's Veggie's turn to go first. Everyone agreed with Boss, except Coffee. I know I'm new here and all, she said, but if we go out first in the first show, shouldn't we go out first in the second show too? Boss just told you how we do it, shouted Bitter. Why can't people listen for crying out loud? Hey, come on, man, chimed Peace Nick calmly. Maybe don't get so uptight, you know. I mean, she's just asking a question. Who is talking to you, peace freak, said Bitter. Why don't you just sit and stare at the floor for a while? Boss intervened. We used to do it that way, Coffee, she said. But Dunce, he always forgot when to get out when it was his turn. (laughs) And that's why Dunce never gets to go out first, I said. He was always getting the timing wrong. We had to push him out like a newborn baby. We all laughed while Dunce sat in the back seat with a big smile across his face. He loved the extra attention. Um... Coffee can go first, said Veggie. I don't mind. I'm not feeling very good. Oh, here we go, said Bitter. What's going on, Veg, said Peacenick. You doing okay? I think I ate something bad, said Veggie. My stomach hurts. I think I might pass out. Boss spoke up quickly. Just do your breathing, Veggie, she said. You just need to calm down. How can your stomach hurt, said Bitter? You barely even eat anything except sticks and twigs. Leave her alone, said Coffee. You know she's got issues. Yeah, she's got issues for all of us, said Bitter, backing off a little. Is it me, or is Mr. George taking a long time tonight, I said. We've got a big church group out there tonight, said Boss. Forty-five to fifty parishioners, I think. Wonderful, said Bitter. Just what we need, a bunch of holy rollers. A bunch of money rollers, said Coffee, who coughed sharply into her sleeve. Ouch, cried Veggie. Dunce, can you please move your knee? That hurts. Dunce squirmed to move, but he only dug his knee in deeper into Veggie's back. Ow, she cried, you're hurting me. Dunce squirmed again, but he couldn't get his knee out of Veggie's back. Ow, she cried again. Come on, Duncey, put your knees together, said Boss. And Veggie, I know you're not feeling well, but please don't take it out on him. 
Veggie hollered back. I'm not taking anything out on him. He's the one who keeps digging his knee into me. She reached behind her and took a whack at Dunce, who pulled backwards, driving his knee deeper into Veggie's back, making her cry out again in pain. Knock it off, you two, shouted Bitter. Don't make me come back there. What are you, I said, their dad? Coffee laughed and then coughed again. Yo, 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 everybody just chill, said Peacenick. Let's all just take a deep breath and try and relax, all right? I'm not taking a deep breath, said Coffee. Somebody in here stinks. Boss gave Coffee a look and said, stop it under her breath. Why is Mr. George taking so long, I said. He knows we're just sitting in here. Why don't you beep at him again there, dog boy, said Bitter. He was really happy about that last time. The others laughed. Just relax, dog face, said Boss. He'll signal us when he's ready, and clearly he's not ready. It's getting really hot in here, said Coffee. Dunce nodded furiously. Turn on the air conditioner, said Veggie. I I'm going to pass out. No, I said. I turned the car off, and I can't turn it back on again, or it'll ruin the whole mystique of the show. He's right, agreed Boss. Protocol says we have to just sit tight and wait for Mr. George to signal us out. I'm going to be sick, said Veggie. Oh, here we go, said Bitter. Veggie's nightly attack right before we go out. Oh, I'm so sorry, Bitter, Veggie snapped. I'm sorry that I can't help the way I feel. Breathe, Veggie, Boss directed. Arguing is just going to make it worse. And Bitter, she said, I spoke to you about this. You need to stop getting on everyone. But every single show we go through this, Bitter said. It's so obnoxious. You're obnoxious, said Coffee, while Dunce laughed out loud, digging his knee into Veggie's back again. I bet there's something wrong with the spotlight, I said. Or maybe somebody got hurt. Well, at least I know who goes out first and who doesn't, said Bitter, twisting around in his seat. Stop it, Boss shouted. Right now, everybody. I don't want to hear another sound. It took a lot for Boss to lose her cool, but once she did, whew, she was a cannonball. We sat for a while, everyone being silent except for Dunce, who was making noises with his nose. Man, I can't see anything out there, said Peacenick, breaking the silence. The windows are tinted so they can't see in, I explained, but that means we can't see out either. What's taking so long, said Coffee. This is getting ridiculous. Uh, I'm really hot, said Veggie. Can't we just open the window just a little bit? I can't, I said. That would mean I'd have to turn the car back on. Can't you just turn the key to the ACC position, said Peacenick? Then you'll have power to just open the windows. No, shouted Bitter. We'll all be out in just a minute. Can't you babies just hold it together? I reached out my hand for the ignition key to turn it to the ACC position, just like Peacenick said, just to open the back windows a little bit. But as my hand touched the key, Bitter reached over me, shouting, No! And he grabbed the key right out of the ignition. What the heck, I said, while Boss shouted, What are you doing? Stop acting like a bunch of whiny infants, Bitter said. I'm not getting fired because Veghead can't stand the heat. Give me back my key, I shouted at him. It's my car and I want my key right now. No, Bitter refused. I'll give it back to you when we're finished. What's wrong with you, Bitter? asked Coffee. Veggie began to cry, which, of course, got Dunce to cry, too. You're being a total fascist, man, said Peacenick. Oh, be quiet, peace freak, said Bitter, or I'll knock you back into 1975. Give me that key right now, growled Boss, in a tone that none of us had ever heard before. Or so help me, someone is going to get hurt. We all fell dead quiet. Bitter reached back and dropped the key into Boss's lap and muttered, Fine, here. Can I please have my key back, Boss? I asked. You just shut your mouth. Everyone just shut up. I'm gonna be sick, said Veggie, who started gagging and making sick noises. Oh, man, said Peacenick, that's nasty. Dunce started making sick noises, too, imitating Veggie. Don't you dare get sick in this car, Boss shouted, or I will make you eat it. Everyone was freaked out by Boss's reaction. The look on her face was like a mad woman, and sweat was trickling down over her face paint like rain on a pumpkin. We were all sweating profusely now. This was longer than we'd ever been stuck in the car before. With all our wigs and costumes, it felt like it was 120 degrees in there, with no room to move. That's it, I said, and I reached across Bitter's lap and opened up the glove box. Oh, no, you don't, shouted Bitter. You're not allowed to use that. 
I took my cell phone out of the glove box, which I kept in there in case of emergencies. And to me, with everyone burning up and starting to lose control, this seemed like an emergency. Dogface, you know the rules, growled Boss. I will break your hand if you turn that phone on. Boss, I said, I know the rules, and if you want to break my hand, then fine, go ahead. But we're dying in here, and there's nobody signaling us to come out. I pressed the power button and turned on the phone. Without hesitating, Boss lunged from the back seat and screamed, I told you not to turn that phone on! The next thing I knew, Boss was on top of me in the front seat. Half her costume got caught on the clasp of the seatbelt. Makeup smeared across my shirt, and she grabbed at my hands, clawing with her soft gloves to get at my phone. Give me that phone now, she ranted wildly. I pulled the phone close into my chest and tucked my hands in to keep her from getting it. Stop it, stop it, cried Coffee, while Dunce began crying harder, and Veggie was now being sick all over herself. Peacenick tried to pull Boss back, while Bitter was shouting, I told you not to use it, I told you! Boss started climbing over the seat, pulling Peacenick with her, as I was being crushed, forced down into the space beneath the steering wheel. Boss's elbow pressed against the steering wheel and accidentally beeped the horn. Great, shouted Bitter, there goes the show, we're all getting fired now! Coffee was pulling on Peacenick, who was pulling on Boss, shouting, Stop it! Stop it, both of you, right now! You're acting like children! Boss was completely over the seat, pounding on top of me, drooling in my ear and fully raging. I'll kill you, she screamed, her eyes wild and her makeup smearing everywhere. I'll kill you! Then suddenly, without warning, she stopped, and we all froze. No one breathed, and we looked upward, as if to the stars. There was a sound, a familiar sound. It was the sound of Mr. George's musical triangle ringing out. It was the signal we were waiting for. Mr. George was finally calling us to come out, to join him in that sweet spotlight under the big top. And just as suddenly as we had all heard the ringing of Mr. George's triangle, my eyes snapped open. It was bright and everything was blurry. I blinked a few times to get my focus back. I looked around the small, bright room, squinting to see. It was brutally hot, the summer sun blazing in through all the windows in the waiting room. I could feel the sweat on my back. A large plant was limp and drooping onto a spread of old magazines on the table beside me. Across from me was an old wooden door with a nameplate that read Dr. William Frenza. Beside the door was a small speaker where the musical ringing was coming from. And just as I looked at the speaker, about to curse that musical ringing, it stopped, and a small blue light above the speaker clicked on. The wooden door opened, and Dr. Frenza came out and greeted me. Hello again. Sorry to keep you waiting, he said, smiling. Oh boy, it's hot out here. Are you ready to come in? I stood up slowly and got my bearings. The air conditioner broke down yesterday, he said. They should be coming out tomorrow to fix it. We went inside Dr. Frenz's office and he closed the wooden door. We exchanged informal pleasantries and sat down. The air conditioning in his office was working just fine and it felt so good. Well, it's been quite a while since you've been here, the doctor said. I'm glad you decided to come back. I nodded in agreement, though I was starting to feel a little sick. The last time we met, he said, you were explaining that the voices you were hearing, the clowns, right? I nodded again. He was reading notes off a large pad of paper. Well, we increased your medication too, he said. How's that working out? Are you still hearing the clown voices? I coughed into my armpit to clear my throat and said, no, actually, I haven't heard the clowns in quite a while now. Really, the doctor said, looking like he didn't believe me. Well, that's terrific. He paused and made notes in his pad of paper. Then he looked down at my hands. I quickly drew his attention back. Yeah, that's why I haven't been back to see you in a while, I said. Everything's been quiet and I'm doing great. Everything's been real quiet. Well, I'm glad to hear that, he said, looking back down to my hands. I could feel my forehead starting to sweat. I'd like to get started with our session today, he said, but I see you've got your phone out again. He looked back to my hands and the phone I was fidgeting with. We talked about this, he said, and you know the rules. 
I was feeling really uncomfortable, like I was going to pass out. There was a sharp pain in my back, like someone's knee was pushing into me. I gave the doctor a fake smile and tried to play it cool. Oh, come on, Dr. Friends, I said. You just need to relax. It's just a phone, right? The doctor was getting irritated. You know the rules, he said firmly, and we've talked about this before. I pulled the phone close into my chest and sat back as Dr. Frenza began to lean in close, like an angry father. Why don't you just give me the phone, he said, and we can get started. I'm not feeling so good, Doc, I said. I think I'm going to be sick. He looked at me with big, wide eyes and said, Don't you dare get sick in here. You know the rules. Give me that phone right now. Right now. Right now. Sometimes even the most accomplished and successful people fabricate and conceal the most impressive secrets in the deepest cellars of their minds. Who can say whether those we know around us live in a reality that's similar to our own, or if the world they dwell in is a colorful wonderland of daredevils and clowns all existing in a fantasy world of a three-ring circus? Thank you for joining in for tonight's episode. I hope you'll subscribe to discover new, unusual, and unique experiences in the future. May you walk wisely and always keep a bounce in your pulse. For Aorta Theater, I'm your host, Alexander Pinkle. Good night. Here's now, here's now, here's now, here's now.